Okay. Uh, very good afternoon, honorable person here. Uh, myself as Sengal Marine Technology Manager for the ISTOM IAC program. And uh, first of all, I would like to welcome our uh, chief guest, uh, Dr. Sriram Sankar, assistant professor from NIT Trichy. Uh, welcome, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sindhil Murugan. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you so for much. For the kind sir. invitation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, once again, thanks for accepting our invitation and to be a part of our uh, talk expert series. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, can you can you hear me, Sindhil? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Okay. Yeah, he has started his career at uh, graduate engineer training in Coromandel International, Vishal Patnam, in 2010. Then he's uh, again a project assistant at IAC Bangalore and the junior scientist innovator from uh, Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research, Netherlands, October 2017 to March 2021. And he's worked as a product developer engineer in KLA Tenko Software India Private Limited Channel, May 2021 to October 21. And as assistant professor, uh, Bitsplani, Birla Gova campus from January 2022 to November 2022. Then assistant professor from NIT Trichy. Uh, from November 22 to Dill Day. And he is uh, having the administrative experience in uh, faculty team, Department of India Committee, and the Organizing Committee in Amsterdam 2023 conference and the hackathon January 2022 till, till now. And he has published a number of papers in all reputed journals. And he has signed the awards and the honors of 2006 National Merit Scholarship, Government of India, and a 2008 Summer Fellowship for undergraduate students in the Department of Political Engineering, IIT Madras. And he received the AM Murugapachitir uh, Contemporary Scholarship in 2008, and Institute Gate Scholarship from IIC Bangalore in 2011, and INSA CSA BAE Business Space Travel Fellowship from CACS Chennai. And uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for once again being a part of our team. Uh, it's a yeah. session is for you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. yeah th th thanks for the uh, generous uh, introduction, uh, Sindhil. Uh, I'm very glad to be part of this uh, uh, very prestigious online platform, uh, you know, to be addressing the, the, the best of uh, the minds that our country can have. So uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity. So, uh, so shall we start the presentation now? Yes, sir, please. Okay. So let me share my screen. Um, yeah, uh, you are uh, seeing my screen, right? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, very good afternoon to uh, one and all here. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Shriram Shankar, uh, currently working as uh, an assistant professor with the Department of Instrumentation and Control Engineering, uh, NIT uh, Tiruchirappalli. Uh, so this is a brief uh, you know trajectory that uh, that i have uh, come through i did my phd from the uh, department of instrumentation and applied physics uh, in iisc bangalore and uh, uh, before that i used to work uh, uh, i mean I, I i do have uh, experience from diverse fields i started with uh, uh, core instrumentation in a process uh, fertile, uh, process industry. It was a diammonium phosphate based uh, fertilizer industry. Uh, I was working there and after that I started with my graduate research uh, on scanning probe microscopy in uh, IASC. And uh, after I finished my PhD, uh, I wanted to have, uh, uh, you know, industry or, you know, uh, a research or I would say a translational research experience. So I could get an opportunity to work as a research scientist uh, as part of uh, an organization called TNO. Uh, TNO stands for uh, the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research. Uh, uh, it, it's located in, uh, in, in a place called Delft in the Netherlands. So I was continuing my work further on scanning probe microscopy there especially on the applications of uh, uh, this SPM or AFM for semiconductor industry. And then uh, I chose to move back to India and uh, I started working with uh, uh, KLA. KLA is uh, 
is a company that specializes on defect inspection in uh, you know inline defect inspection for uh, 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 for semiconductor industries and uh, after that i started working with uh, i started my academic career with uh, bitspilani in the goa campus and uh, since last november i've been working with nit uh, trichy so these this is my email and this is my mobile number uh, you can uh, you can note this down if you have uh, any questions related to uh, you know scanning probe microscopy or instrumentation and control engineering in general you can of course uh, uh, talk to me yeah so my research interests are mainly into uh, precision mechatronics uh, you know dynamic modeling of uh, micro structures and so on uh, using control systems as part of uh, instruments that are used for nanotechnological characterization and uh, such systems you would be applying uh, you know a lot of optical instrumentation and uh, uh, very tight position control and so on so it's a it's a it's a combination of several of these clouds interacting with each other so that's what i uh, i have worked on okay so to in today's presentation i thought i could start with uh, an introduction to spm or scanning probe microscopy i'll get into the instrumentation of uh, a typical spm system how do they operate and then some advancements in spm system uh, and then finally i'll uh, close the talk with uh, the applications of spm in semiconductor industry so uh, i would like the session to be more interactive so uh, i might ask you questions and i do expect answers from you and uh, you know if you if you, if you are in need of any clarifications during the middle of the presentation uh, yes you can uh, uh, feel free to stop me okay so let's start with uh, the basic optical microscope that we had in our uh, school okay so it's a compound microscope with which we have looked at uh, you know uh, cells we have looked at the uh, you know the the, the plant uh, tissue like this say onion peel or uh, you know if you if you have a blood smear uh, if you observe it through this sort of an optical microscope you'll be able to see the individual cells okay so this sort of an optical microscope you can describe it to be a collection of lenses that are arranged in such a way that they provide you magnification of uh, you know a uh, few hundreds of x uh, and so on okay so now uh, with this you are able to look at Uh, objects that are you know few tens of microns wide or if if you are uh, in really careful you can look at objects that are few microns wide okay. but let us look at the uh, animal kingdom okay and uh, we see that the cells are only the biggest of the uh, the objects that we know okay so smaller than the cells or the cell organelles like mitochondria and then unicellular organisms and then we have viruses which are even smaller than uh, uh, organisms like bacteria and then ultimately we have uh, uh, dna and uh, dna and rna which are the basic uh, backbone of uh, you know the nucleus or the reproductive material uh, within our cell okay so the the dna strand that the typical width of the dna strand would be around like 1 nanometer the viruses are all in a uh, few tens of nanometers so this is how the uh, this is a, a schematic of the sars cov2 virus which is all like you know few uh, tens to few hundreds of nanometers and further down uh, you know uh, like you know in sub nanometer scales we have uh, atoms and uh, you know molecules 
that are all you know waiting to be observed can we use optical microscopy to uh, to look at these objects any answer if if yes or if no uh, if no you can tell me like you know what do you think as the answer could be okay uh, so maybe uh, yeah so so one important aspect to look at is the wavelength of the light that we are using right so we cannot so there is this diffraction limit that we are uh, uh, that that uh, that that prevents us from looking into these smaller objects directly with visible light okay so one way to uh, overcome this problem is to use light uh, light waves that are of lesser wavelength than visible light so you can use uh, x rays uh, and uh, you know such shorter wavelength uh, 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 you know radiation for example uh, uv or uh, x rays and uh, you might have also come across uh, electron microscopes wherein we generate the uh, we utilize the quantum properties of these electrons with uh, by which they display wave nature and the wavelength of such waves or the electron waves they are all in nanometers or uh, you know uh, on such scales so we can use electron wave in order to image such smaller objects right like viruses so this is a uh, acm image of a virus okay however we know that in order to generate this electron microscope image we need to maintain uh, we need to maintain the sample in a in an ultra high vacuum condition okay and uh, these electron wave these electrons are usually generated by applying very high potential of like you know several kilovolts and so on and uh, if your sample if it cannot handle such uh, extreme conditions of high voltage and high vacuum and so on it it simply becomes impossible for you to image such uh, uh, such uh, objects with using electron microscopes see one important disadvantage with electron microscopy is that the uh, in case of dielectrics we have charge being built up in uh, uh, you know because of the continuous uh, stream of electrons that are impinging on the sample material okay so the uh, so the sample gets char charged and uh, the the sample gets charged and you know uh, the uh, the the uh, the resolution and uh, everything goes uh, goes quite bad right so in order to circumvent this particular problem we go for an entirely new sort of a technique which is uh, which is scanning probe microscopy okay so one so scanning probe microscopy is is a family of techniques that are uh, that uses a small uh, a very sharp probe or which i can say an atomically sharp probe in order to uh, in order to observe the uh, the sample or to infer the material properties of the sample in a very localized uh, 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 space okay and which is all in either uh, nanometer or sub nanometer resolution so so in general in this uh, presentation uh, i would concentrate more on atomic force microscopy because i believe that uh, it's the most important technique among the uh, family of uh, uh, scanning probe microscopy techniques uh, i will also talk about some uh, more techniques but looking at the instrumentation uh, point of view afm is still the most important technique that we have in spm 
Okay. Uh, uh, how does an AFM work or atomic force microscope work? So before getting onto this, uh, in order to drive home the message of how uh, how the uh, AFM works, let me narrate two situations to you. Okay. Uh, okay. I have a question. What is the main point of difference between SPM and SEM? Okay. So in an SEM, we are we are using electrons to uh, to interact with uh, the material. Okay. However, in case of SPM, we are using a probe. Okay. Uh, a probe with a sharp tip to interact with the material. Okay. So depending on the material, uh, the principle of operation of the SPM. Uh, techniques, we are, uh, uh, you know, we, so when compared to SEM, scanning electron microscope, which is usually restricted to only conducting samples and which are compatible with uh, ultra high vacuum conditions, in case of scanning probe microscopy, uh, our, uh, uh, so the, we can image a wide variety of uh, materials, including you know conductors, dielectrics, and insulators, and uh, even uh, you know biological cells, and then uh, you know materials, very soft materials uh, that are you know usually immersed in liquids and so on. So all these, an entire set of materials that cannot be imaged using SEM, you can uh, do so with an SPM. Okay, so. This is the first situation that I want you to uh, imagine. Okay, how does a blind person walk on 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 a road? Okay, how how does he or she uh, circumvent all the uh, obstacles that uh, you know they they come across on the road? So they are using a stick, right? So they'll be making a small tap on the road, right? And then infer the forces or the reactive forces between the road, uh, between the road and the, the 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 tip of this stick, right? And uh, through this stick, they're able to infer these forces, and uh, by feeling these forces, they are able to sense that okay. I'm hitting an obstacle. Okay, so it can be either you know uh, a step up, or it can even be a step down. Right. So in case of a step down, the person realizes that in order to make the impact, uh, uh, he 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 needs to bring the stick even down, and then feel the impact, and uh, you know. Uh, judge the height of the step that he need to take down. Okay, so this is the situation one, and uh, I also want you to realize that with this sort of a technique, it is also able to look at the you know the small uh, feel the small ridges that are on the tiles in the uh, on the platform right so all these small features that we have here either the pattern uh, pattern of lines or or these pattern of dots uh, the blind person is able to realize with just using the stick and by using a gentle tapping on the surface on which he or she is walking okay so this is the First situation that I wanted you to uh, imagine. This is the second situation. We have uh, two apples here. One is, uh, of course, fresh and uh, very good looking, and the other is rotten. How will you? Uh, okay, imagine that you are blindfolded again. How will you distinguish between the good apple and the bad apple? I would, I would prefer one of you to answer. By touching. Okay, so when we uh, when we say touching, uh, what exactly uh, uh, are we like? You know, 
uh, feeling or what exactly are we looking into or you know in inferring by smoothening touch okay the surface sur the surface roughness and uh, uh, i think uh, the smoothness uh, whatever the smoothness is sir uh, it actually uh, brings the idea that uh, the apple is fresh or not yes yes sure so you can look at the surface features here yes yes ma'am yeah and and also so uh, so uh, piyush used this word uh, 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 like you know roughness and also smoothness i'll add one more word to it like how hard or soft the material is okay so what you can do is uh, you are you are using your thumb you are making a small um, you know you are applying a little force okay and then see what is the reactive force that this apple is giving back to you okay if it is a good apple the material inside is hard so you know you feel it difficult to like you know really press however in case of uh, you know the rotten apple it's easier for you to press right so when we make an indentation so that's what we are trying to do here by applying a force the indentation depth on the uh, surface is quite less for the harder material when compared to the softer material okay so this is okay for a for a big fruit like an apple we are able to do it with our thumb okay now can we repeat the same measurement with uh, for a pomegranate so probably we might have to uh, borrow the concept from our uh, blind man and uh, you know use if we can probably use a needle okay just uh, try to you know gently poke the uh, pomegranate seed and see whether it is going further deep in or not okay so can we use a similar technique in order to uh, feel our viruses and bacteria and other atoms and molecules at the nano scale we can do so just that we need an atomically sharp needle okay so we are taking an atomically sharp needle we are gently trying to poke the specimen and then infer the reactive forces that the specimen is applying back to the needle okay so these are the interatomic forces you know uh, so you might have you might have come across uh, you know uh, van der waals uh, forces or you know hertzian contact forces and so on so these interatomic forces they depend on the separation of the distance between these forces okay we are we can fortunate so because of uh, the uh, advancement in silicon uh, micro slash nano fabrication techniques we are able to come across such tips which are uh, you know few nanometers wide uh, and we can use such tips in order to poke our molecules and atomic scale samples okay so now how do we really sense these forces it's a challenge because we need to find uh, a really soft spring okay that we can attach to this tip and somehow detect the uh, compression and expansion of this spring to infer these forces okay so this red arrow mark is uh, uh, like you know so the sample is applying forces through the tip to to the spring that we are uh, uh, going to have we are transmitting these forces to the spring allowing the spring to compress and expand okay and somehow we want to measure the compression and elongation of the spring this is what we have to do the challenge is that the magnitude of forces and the uh, the you know uh the space in which we have to detect these forces 
that's a real challenge okay so let us look at uh, okay so this is this is how the uh, tip sample interaction forces uh, typically uh, i mean i've just drawn a hand drawn a schematic of how these forces would vary based on the separation of uh, uh, the distance between the tip and sample when we are really far uh, we don't have any interaction between the sample and the tip but once we are once we have started bringing it down closely at about uh, you know a nanometer or two uh, we we start feeling some forces these forces are of attractive in nature okay it could be because of certain uh, dipoles that have been generated on either side of the tip and the sample so you can imagine that there could be some positive charges here and negative charges here and here there could be some negative charges and positive charges and uh, the the overall interaction of them would be of electrostatic in nature and uh, that would be attractive okay so now you are bringing this these two atoms quite close to each other when we see the two atoms we are talking about the farthest atom in the tip and the nearest atom on the sample that is to the tip okay there electrons start start interacting with each other okay so electrons they both are like uh, having like charges so their interaction is quite repulsive right so when we have this electron cloud cloud started interacting with each other that's what we call as contact so contact has been made between the tip and the sample when the sample offers resistance further to to allow the tip uh, you know to poke into it right so within the atomic scale that's when you have the electron clouds interacting with each other okay so let us look at the magnitude of forces that we are having here first is we need to have the instrument where we can control the uh, separations all in nanometers and in sub nanometer scale and the forces that we are all measuring it's all in nano newtons or uh, uh, fractions of nano newtons or even pico newtons okay so how do we fabricate this magical spring that that is able to allow us to measure these forces okay so uh, so let us so uh, so these attractive forces are mainly as i mentioned due to dipole dipole interaction and van der waals forces and the repulsive forces are due to electron electron interaction okay so let us borrow a concept from the simplest spring that we know which is a swimming pool diving board okay so here uh, so your diving board is just a long plank at the end of which if the person stands or applies a force this diving board bends right so this is called a cantilever beam technically and uh, the cantilever is the simplest spring that we know so what we are doing is we are taking this tip and then attaching it to a cantilever which is all like you know quite uh, in micro scale and by looking at the angle of bending of such cantilever we can infer the forces okay so for uh, attractive forces we'll be having the uh, uh, the cantilever to be bending downward and for repulsive forces it would be bending upward right so now we have the tip we just need to attach it to a flexible cantilever so we borrow we use silicon micro machining techniques to come up with a cantilever which is all in uh, micrometer uh, scales and at the end uh, we again use certain techniques to have to etch a tip okay and at the end of the tip uh, if we have a really good control of the fabrication process we can achieve nanometer scale uh, tip radiuses so now 
we have uh, the, the tip attached to the spring that we wanted. We just need to have, uh, have a measurement system wherein we can measure the uh, deflection of the spring or the cantilever, right? So these are the different uh, uh, types of probes that are available uh, commercially. So this is how the overall cantilever beam looks like with the tip at the end. Please pay attention to the kind of scales that we are having look uh, that we have uh, look at. Uh, this is a zoomed in view of uh, the tip, and then if we zoom into that, uh, I don't know the end of the tip further. Then you say that you see that the radius are all in less than eight nanometers and so on. These are the uh, dimensions of such a cantilever beam that is available in the market. Okay. So what is the probe here? The probe is the combination of both the cantilever portion that bends and the tip portion that uh, experiences the force from the sample. We also have uh, V-shaped triangular uh, cantilever probes. So wherein we have, uh, you know, it, it it's still called as a cantilever because it's a it's it, it's a plank that is fixed at one end and free at the other end. But just that instead of the uniform rectangle, we have uh, the triangle shaped V to be there in order to uh, allow the bending. So we use one of these uh, cantilevers, and then uh, we need to construct an AFM system based on this. So how do we do that? All we need to do is take the tip, provide it a command, so that uh, it can be dragged along a surface. So whenever it meets an obstacle, we need a mechanism wherein the tip can be lifted Okay, and uh, if there are further, uh, you know, uh, dips or, you know, uh, down sort of features or pits, then we also need to make the tip follow such a pit. So all this is done while we drag the tip along a surface, very similar to how the blind man uh, walks on the platform, right? So, so, so based on this, we need to construct the overall AFM uh, uh, instrumentation system. So what we are doing is we are uh, borrowing some concepts from control systems or feedback control systems. From the probe, we need to make a force measurement. And based on the measured force, we need to run our control system or control algorithm that generates a position command to move the probe either up or down. Okay, so such a system can be uh, uh, visualized this way. We have a probe. The probe is now placed close to the sample uh, that, that we are interested in. And now this probe is kept uh, you know, below an actuator. Okay. So any command given by the controller to the actuator can move the probe up and down. So we are moving this entire probe, which includes both the cantilever portion and the tip up and down with respect to the sample. Okay. So the probe bends whenever it uh, hits the sample and experiences uh, certain attractive or repulsive forces. And uh, we are uh, able to uh, measure this bending through an optical uh, measurement system. So what we are doing is we are launching a laser beam onto this uh, cantilever. We coat the cantilever with a reflective material. So the reflected rays that are coming from the uh, uh, the cantilever would be made to hit on a photo detector. Okay. So this photo detector I call it as uh, a position sensitive photo detector. It has four quadrants. So we'll get get to know uh, a bit more into the detail how it works. But the the output of such a measurement system would be how much this, uh, this spot has moved on this detector. And that in turn 
uh, helps us infer the magnitude of forces that are acting on the tip can uh, uh, cantilever combination and uh, those forces are fed to, to our uh, controller where it compares it with a set point and based on the error it takes a feedback action okay so this is the simplest schematic that we can come come up with for uh, an afm system and uh, the simplest technique with which we can use such a system is called a contact mode afm wherein you maintain continuous contact with the sample and the tip okay so whenever there are these uh, ups and downs you will be having a continuous change in the forces that uh, you are experiencing as inferred through the optical measurement system so with this uh, you know with this schematic we are able to measure the forces at one single location and also if we want we can uh, we can control those forces based on the tip sample separation okay all we need to do is uh, drag the tip along uh, you know uh, a specific area on the specimen or on the sample so as uh, you know in a raster scan motion so we have along the x y axis so x i call as the fast scan axis and y as the slow scan axis if we are able to do this measurement and control of these forces while we are dragging the tip uh, on the sample surface we are able to infer the forces at different points on the sample and uh, from that we can infer the geometry of the sample or the topography of the sample okay so throughout what we are what will be uh, measuring or the tip sample interaction forces wherein it's a combination of two main properties first is uh, the uh, the hardness of the material okay so how strong are the repulsive forces when you want to uh, poke the sample further after making contact and when you want to pull out the uh, the tip further from the sample what are the adhesion forces that we are having okay so uh, the combination of these two will determine how your interaction with the sample is going to be at different locations so just by uh, you know performing this along different lines okay we are able to generate the topography uh, of the sample wherein we are able to get the xy uh, features and also the z height over which such features are present okay because of the way in which we are uh, interacting with the sample the way with which we are measuring the interaction forces uh, this technique atomic force microscopy is compatible with a wide variety of samples okay and based on how sharp your tip is you can achieve either atomic scale or even subatomic scale resolution okay so this is an example of an uh, a, a very beautiful subatomic scale uh, image of uh, a silicon uh, so you can see that uh, you know so this is this dot or uh, each of these dots are silicon atoms nicely arranged on a uh, on a on a lattice and you can also observe certain point defects in this uh, image okay uh if but this this sort of a very beautiful image you can get only if uh, you are very careful experimental experimenter but in most cases what you will be looking at is uh, on a on a flat surface you will be you will be measuring the roughness of uh, the features so this is an example image of uh, a clean glass surface where the roughness has been measured to be about 0.8 nanometer okay so these are examples of certain contact mode images okay uh we we mentioned that we need a certain actuator to move the tip up and down okay there are two such actuators that you would need uh one to move the sample relative to the probe 
along the x and y axis and the second to move the probe with uh, uh, relative to the sample along the z direction okay when i say relative to each other either the probe or the sample which means that either the probe can be moved or the sample so such uh, nano positioners or uh, you know uh, these are usually made of uh, piezo actuated uh, stages okay so piezo actuation as uh, as you can remember it is the conversion of uh, electrical energy to mechanical energy based on the uh, electric field that you are creating within a certain material it undergoes a strain and uh, because of that strain whatever uh, uh, the overall structure that you have at the end of which we mount the probe that undergoes a deflection so ultimately it results in certain move uh, certain uh, uh, translational displacement of the stage along x y and z directions okay so uh, about the optical measurement system what we have is a quadrant photo detector when i say quadrant it's made of like you know four uh, equal parts let me call them as a b c and d okay so based on how the uh, uh, the uh, how the uh, laser uh, reflected laser spot is incident on them you can have you know some of the quadrants to be illuminated more than the other so how do we measure that we measure the photo currents from each of these quadrants convert them to certain voltages using an i to v converter or what is called a trans impedance amplifier and then we do an arithmetic operation of these uh, uh, the, the, the the four voltage signals that we have uh, which i have indicated here as v a b c d do a difference operation in order to get two signals one that shows you uh, the top minus bottom and the other signal that shows you right minus left okay with which we are able to distinguish between the uh, upward and downward motion of the spot and the right and left motion of the spot which would in turn be caused by either the bending of the uh, of the probe or a twisting of the probe so this you can imagine it to be uh, uh, the result of the twisting of the probe because of which the uh, the spot will be moving along the left right axis any any doubts so far okay um yeah. so now that we have uh, got into this uh, optical microscope uh, i mean optical measurement system we we now know uh, overall like you know what all um, uh, what all the individual blocks that we need so one example of you know uh, you do doing one more contact mode uh, sort of technique is the lateral force microscopy wherein we are making contact of the tip with the sample but then we are trying to make a small motion of the tip with respect to the sample along the uh, right left axis like you know parallel to the width of the cantilever because of which there will be some frictional forces that will act on the tip which tend to twist the sample uh, twist the uh, twist the cantilever probe okay so this would be uh, this can be measured through you know this uh, right left difference in the photo signals and uh, you know such uh, such signals measured over um, uh, over the region of interest can provide you an indication of the material contrast okay such information is not typically present on the topography signal or uh, you know the signal that you are using to uh, regulate the tip sample interaction along the vertical direction so this is called a friction force microscopy or a, a lateral force microscopy if you are not careful enough with respect to 
the forces that you are applying on the sample you can end up either uh, uh, you can in, in, end up uh, like you know removing material from the sample so such uh, 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 such marking can be done using afm tip so these are lines that have been marked on on a, on a silicon uh, wafer by just by using different forces to apply on uh, apply between the tip and the sample okay so at about 10 nano newton force okay the groove that you are able to make on the silicon is already 2.5 nanometer so we need to be really careful about the forces that we are applying so that we don't end up uh, uh, we don't end up damaging the sample okay so in order to avoid uh, you know uh, this particular drawback of the contact mode afm wherein uh, you know you need to be very careful about the forces that you are applying and then if your sample is loosely fixed uh, you know to the substrate then what can happen is you can drag away some of the uh, sample along with the tip for example if uh, you have uh, you know a dna strand to be uh, just kept on a substrate and if you are using this contact mode afm in order to measure this uh, uh, in order to characterize this dna strand and what could happen is as soon as you start scanning it will start it will sort of like you know scoop away the dna strand along with the tip we don't want uh, such an accident to happen so therefore uh, uh, we use a dynamic mode afm in order to sample is and then the cantilever is vibrated slightly or the uh, the cantilever is vibrated with such a larger relatively larger amplitude so that during each of this uh, you know uh, vibrational cycle it is able to make contact with the sample so accordingly when we are uh, making this tapping contact during each of this vibrational cycle that's called as tapping mode afm or an amplitude mode afm and uh, in case if you are uh, you know imaging away from the sample uh, you know you use what is called a non contact mode afm wherein you measure the the changes in the uh, the, the the resonant frequencies of the probe as the forces are applied from the sample So this is called FM AFM or frequency modulation AFM. So these are the different techniques as part of the dynamic mode AFM. Okay. The advantage is that because of uh, this intermittent contact contact that you have with uh, the sample, the the overall average forces that you apply on the sample are quite uh, small, or you are having gentle forces uh, being applied while scanning. So because of this. it makes possible in situ characterization where some of the uh, sample materials are only loosely fixed with the substrate on which they are placed so uh, as you can imagine in order for biological samples the dynamic mode afm or i can be bit more uh, um, uh, a bit more specific the tapping mode afm is the most commonly used mechanism for measurement so this is uh, a tapping mode image of uh, the covid virus okay so uh, you have uh, these sort of structures that are uh, uh, that are resolved but these are not really the spikes it might be some collection of spikes or some other way in which uh, you know instead of a round nice ball like this you have some sort of distortions on the outer surface you can im image uh, you know dna rna or uh, such uh, macro molecules like proteins okay uh, that is dispersed loosely on 
uh, a mica sort of a substrate and with AFM you are able to measure the height of the DNA strand. In this case it is about to 3 nanometers. Uh, I mean it, it ranges from about 1 nanometer to 3 nanometer. If you are able to run this particular instrument in a very fast way, what happens is uh, uh, you can record in real time the changes in structures that take place, say, uh, in response to certain changes in the um, environment. For example, this is a crab-like molecule that is, this is called an FACT protein. These crab-like structures, they, uh, they undergo a change within a fraction of a second. And this provides, uh, you know, a motor action for, uh, for the molecule to reach a distance, okay? So these are called molecular motors, which are present in every uh, muscular cells that we have, okay? So uh, in order to characterize these sort of uh, samples, what we would need is a high-speed AFM wherein we can generate multiple such images, uh, you know, within a fraction of a uh, second and look at these images at sort of like, you know, a time lapse, okay, in order to uh, look at the changes in the structure. However, uh, those of you who have used an AFM in the past might recall that uh, it takes more than a minute or so to generate one image within a conventional AFM. So therefore, you would need um, an advanced AFM or what is an, uh, uh, a high-speed AFM or multi-frames per second uh, imaging rate AFM in order to perform this sort of a characterization. So uh, please recall that either this or this sort of a characterization is not possible with any of uh, you know the other techniques such as scanning electron microscopy and so on. That's that's why I call uh, you know atomic force microscopy to be uh, to be a uniquely versatile technique. Any any doubt so far? Okay. So we had a look at uh, this dynamic mode AFM, okay, where we are uh, vibrating the cantilever. Accordingly, what uh, as the deflections that we are measuring from the uh, position sensitive photo detector, it will also be some sort of an oscillatory uh, wave, like, you know, a sine wave. By looking at the amplitude and phase of these uh, oscillations, we can perform, uh, you know, a topography image and uh, a material contrast sensitive image simultaneously. In order to perform such imaging, this, this is the sort of the electronics that uh, you would need. We have the photo detector from which we are generating two signals, the top minus bottom and left minus right. The left minus right gives you the friction channel imaging in case if you are maintaining continuous contact with the sample. The top minus bottom is now a sine wave. We are feeding that sine wave to what is called a lock-in amplifier, uh, which is a demodulator to measure the amplitude and phase. So we take the amplitude and uh, the, uh, the phase information. The amplitude we are using it uh, using to regulate the overall tip sample interaction, while the phase we are inferring to uh, to look at the material contrast. Okay, and this amplitude it reaches uh, a differential amplifier that generates the error signal between the current amplitude and a set point that is fed to a PID controller. A PID is uh, a proportional integral derivative controller. It has three gains, uh, three settings, a P, a P gain, an I gain, and D gain. Based on how you are setting each of them, your controller can be a bit slow or a bit fast. Okay. And the command of such a controller uh, through certain amplification stage can be fed to the actuator, okay, which is uh, a piezoelectric. Uh, 
uh, uh, actuated stage as we had a look at. Okay, the motion of such a piezoelectric stage can be uh, can be monitored through a Z sensor, or uh, you know, it can either be a strain gauge or uh, a capacitive based strain gauge, and so on. A capacitive based, uh, uh, you know, um, a displacement a detector, and so on. Okay, so with this, we had a brief look into what are the integral components of any AFM system. Uh, even though the title of the talk was scanning probe microscopy, you might wonder that till now I have only been talking about atomic force microscopy, wherein we look at the interaction forces that are measured between the tip and the specimen. Okay. However, as I mentioned, SPM is a family of techniques uh, which also includes scanning tunneling microscopy. So these are the different uh, 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 techniques that fall within the family of SPM, uh, as uh, I mean, as I borrowed from this particular web page. So most of them, it's not possible for anyone to master all these techniques. But I can tell you that if you understand the instrumentation of AFM, then all these techniques at some, some stage would be using the skeleton of this AFM instrumentation, and on top of that, you'll be using. Uh, certain other forces that, that, that are measured with respect to certain changes in the parameters. For example, in case of uh, scanning tunneling microscope, we, uh, we look at the, we measure the tunneling current between the tip and the sample. So you apply a certain bias between the tip and the sample. And for uh, when the electron clouds are closely uh, interacting with each other, there will be a tunneling current that will be set up, and that current depends on the distance of separation between the tip and the sample. Similarly, there is a scanning near field optical microscopy wherein uh, you launch a laser beam through a small aperture that is located at the tip of the probe, bring the tip very close to the sample, you know, within an offset of about 10 nanometer or so. And uh, you look at the near field uh, uh, distribution of this, uh, you know, uh, this optical field or, you know, or, or this electromagnetic field. And that you, you capture again through uh, your measurement system with which you can perform this scanning near field optical microscopy. Okay. Uh, in magnetic force microscopy, you have this AFM tip, but the tip is coated with a magnetic material. Okay, so imagine that your sample has sample is magnetic, but the magnets are all uh, uh, you know of different orientation, either north and south and so on. So if you bring this magnetic, so firstly you need to know what is the uh, topography of such a sample. So once you know the topography, then you bring the tip close to the uh, magnetic material. And then based on the changes in this magnetic force, you can infer whether it is of uh, uh, the same polarity or a different polarity and so on. Okay. Uh, with this, you can characterize uh, the, uh, uh, the grain boundaries in ferromagnetic materials and so on. In, in an electrostatic force microscopy, we measure the, uh, the variations in the sample's electric field or, uh, you know, the, uh, or accordingly, the equivalent uh, electrostatic force that is set up between the tip and the sample. Okay. Let us imagine that in an electronic material, you have different, uh, uh, you have the material to be arranged on ridges like this, each having different polarity. Okay. And uh, between each of these ridges, you'll be experiencing a different force that can be uh, used to infer, for example, the concentration of dopants uh, uh, that are uh, present within the material. Or if you are uh, passing electric current through uh, you know, these channels, then whether the current is passing through or somewhere do you have uh, 
any uh, any blockage in the electric current that could be because of certain defects so all this could be uh, characterized using an electrostatic force microscope there is uh, one more uh, uh, so, so this is an example of uh, electrostatic force microscopy here you have uh, uh, a ferromagnetic material okay uh, so now what you do is uh, with uh, with with another tool you are able to erase uh, erase this particular material so it's like having a smudge between uh, you know whatever the material property that you have here and here and that sorts of leaks into the other region so these sorts of uh, defects could be identified with uh, electrostatic force microscopy so this is an uh, example of uh, nano wires that are coated with a certain material okay placed on a substrate if you look at just the topography image it is very hard for you to differentiate between which is the substrate and which is the nano wire okay however with uh, this efm electro electrostatic force microscopy you are able to clearly distinguish between the nano wires and the substrate okay there is one more technique called uh, kelvin probe uh, force microscopy so with which you are able to characterize the difference in work functions between the material of the sample tip and the material of the sample okay what can it be used for uh, this is an example application you have uh, the transistor being made the you have source and drain and uh, this is the uh, you know the uh, the the gate channel that you that you are having so what you are doing is uh, you are uh, you are uh, exposing half the gate to a stream of uh, alpha particles which are uh, you know helium ions right so because of this the dopant concentration within this gate uh, 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 gate region that changes between what i call a pristine unexposed region and the exposed region well this sort of a defect can not be identified using a topography image however with this kpfm kelvin probe force microscopy image we are able to uh, identify such a defect okay so in general uh, you know these sorts of different defects in uh, in electronic uh, materials can be identified with different materials in uh, in an spm or an afm okay so this is an example of uh, a park afm nx10 uh, you know uh, that can be used so i'm not uh, i mean uh, i'm just using this park afm as an example and uh, in in no way i am making any uh, uh, any uh, advert i am doing any advertising for this particular uh, company or the product okay so uh, if we break this particular afm what we see here is firstly we need uh, a positioning stage below which we are uh, uh, we are mounting the probe and then we have a sample which is uh, which is placed on like another positioning uh, stage that moves along x and y and uh, where exactly are we placing the probe with respect to the sample in order, in order to uh, uh, observe that we also integrate an optical microscope and uh, a camera based system to uh, this particular uh, uh, actuator accordingly the sen the actuator has uh, has a slot or an aperture in the middle through which we are able to capture uh, camera images okay so these are the different parts of uh, the uh, the uh, the afm system in order to uh, connect to the different actuators and actuators and the sensors that we have here uh, we are using certain electronic boxes which are uh, which are not shown in this particular picture using these knobs we can adjust the uh, the position of the optical uh, beam or the laser beam that is falling on the probe 
Okay, so this is how the probe holder uh, look like. Here we are placing uh, a fresh cantilever probe with a tip that is uh, that would be made in contact with the sample. Here you have uh, the uh, Z actuator and uh, also the optical measurement system integrated onto a single structure. So accordingly, if the uh, Z actuator moves up and down, the uh, the laser measurement system is also moving accordingly. Okay, so uh, yeah, so this is an example of the different uh, different components of a typical uh, AFM system. Here, there is one advantage with this particular system is that the Z motion of the probe and the XY motion of the sample are decoupled from each other. Otherwise, there are also some tube scanners wherein um, you are able to uh, make uh, XY motion, but they also result in a cross-axis sensitivity with respect to uh, Z motion. Okay. So in order to calibrate this sort of an instrument, we take uh, a calibration grating, which are a predefined patterns of uh, you know known pitch and depth and we look at the images that we have observed uh, that we have measured whether such pitch and the depth are being maintained or not accordingly uh, we can also infer the tip radius from such images so therefore this calibration uh, is very important uh, which needs to be performed uh, you know every week or every now and then in AFM instruments. And uh, it's very important that uh, this AFM system is enclosed within a certain vibration uh, in, uh, isolated enclosure. Firstly, you'll be, you'll be uh, housing this entire system on a platform uh, that is isolated from the ground through uh, a pneumatic, uh, you know, a column or an air column that also acts as a vibration isolated and also it is housed within a certain chamber that uh, that also provides you an acoustic isolation okay. so some important aspects also to look at while uh, performing the measurement is that the uh, there is always some addition due to the water meniscus that you that you are having between the the sample and the tip okay so this water meniscus it results in increased adhesion between the tip and the sample in order to uh, minimize the effect of this uh, you know it is it is possible that you can you can perform this uh, you can either heat uh, you, uh, you know either the probe or the sample you, usually the sample can be uh, heated or you can purge, you know, uh, a jet of nitrogen within this environment for some time so that any water molecules and so on that are present on the sample can be carried away along with the, uh, along with the nitrogen jet. Okay. Uh, one very important aspect is that uh, please ensure that you are using a sharp tip, uh, you know, whose sharpness is uh, comparable to the uh, the feature uh, uh, the, the feature width that you are uh, planning to look at okay so let us imagine that if this is the tip geometry okay and this is the object just a single antenna kind of a, a structure a nano wire sort of a structure that is standing the image would look like a ball okay that's because the tip when it uh, infers this uh, presence of the nano wire it can only move like up and down, but not in a very sharp manner. So that's why you have a ball. If you are having a longer wire, you are having a longer ball or a, or, or a taller ball. If you are having two wires that are placed close to each other, now you look at two balls that are closely spaced with each other. Okay, this is how the... Uh, this is how the image would look like. And if there are several such wires that are placed with each other, it is not even able uh, for you to 
distinguish between these spires. So that's why this tip geometry ultimately decides the resolution with which you can capture the images. So these are the different tips that you have. Uh, you can have like, you know, sharp tips, ultra sharp tips using focused and beam milling. You can even sharpen some of the tips so that, uh, you know, what you have ultimately is, uh, is, is a tip of a desired aspect ratio and, uh, you know, uh, a desired aspect ratio and sharpness. So these are the kind of tips that can get into a trench kind of a feature. And such trenches are quite a plenty, uh, you know, on uh, in, in, during the intermediate steps of uh, electronic uh, chip fabrication. And then you can also have, based on the, uh, the, uh, the hardness of the sample, okay, you can go even for, for a diamond coated tip wherein uh, you know, you grow, uh, you know, diamond on the tip so that the entire tip becomes like, you know, very hard so that this is quite, um, it, it's quite uh, resistant to tip wear. Okay. So over repeated scan motion, the tip gets blunt. Okay. So that's what uh, this sort of a diamond coated tip would avoid or minimize and for conductive sort of applications where you want to measure the electric forces you would need to use a gold coated tip which is also uh, which is also conducting with respect to the sample uh, and then how exactly so these are some tips for afm imaging uh, so use the right substrate and make sure that it is sufficiently flat because if you if you want to use such a uh, rock kind of a substrate, if you want to look at, you know, there is a possibility that the tip is not the part that makes contact with the sample. Okay, so to ensure that you are making only the contact between the the tip or the ultimate end of the tip and the sample, you need to have atomically flat samples okay so that it uh, requires quite some uh, you know polishing and other preparation techniques and then you need to have the substrates to be quite clean some examples are mica disc glass slides and uh, you know silica discs and so on uh, and then for uh, biological samples you would need to perform all the uh, measurements within a buffer solution so that the sample that you are looking at is, uh, is, is stable and its structure is intact. And uh, you need to be quite quick, quick so that you are not letting the buffer evaporate. Okay. So whenever you have any, uh, any doubt on the kind of measurement uh, uh, conditions that you need to maintain for AFM imaging, please refer to uh, you know, already existing literature and so on okay so this is like you know only one half of uh, what i had prepared the other half was more on the semiconductor fabrication but because of the want of time uh, yeah i would uh, i would postpone this if time permits to a different session yeah so i would like to thank the audience for uh, you know your patience so uh yeah let us look at the questions that we have here um yeah so i i request everyone like whoever if you are having any question you can uh, you can say it out here or you can also uh, type here so radha narayanan has asked this question what is the science behind higher the carrot of diamonds it's good does higher carrot have uh, varied physical and mechanical properties apart from total internal reflection? What are other properties? Uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not really familiar with uh, the carrot scale, what, what it is based on and, uh, and so on. But uh, when you have, you know, uh, naturally occurring diamonds, if you want to use an AFM system in order to characterize such diamonds, 
it needs to be sufficiently polished uh, so that it, because like you know it, at different facets you would have uh, you know the, the you can have the properties some of the properties to be different so especially if you are looking at the optical properties and so on then uh, you would you will be looking at certain uh, techniques like uh, near field uh, uh, scanning optical imaging and uh, so on but unfortunately i i apologize i'm not very familiar with uh, uh, the carrot scale of diamonds and what exactly it uh, it refers to maybe you can you can uh, describe it a bit more so that uh, we can combinedly have uh, arrive at uh, a reasoning uh, radha are you there any any other questions so uh uh so i would like to also take an opportunity to mention here that uh, uh we right now have uh, so nit trichy has the phd Uh, admission cycle for the next semester to be open uh, so till the 31st of uh, this month october uh, phd applications are being invited uh, so you would need to submit the application in a certain portal and also send it uh, as a hard copy to the institute uh, these i mean we do have uh, uh, open phd positions especially on this particular topic on the development of instrumentation for uh, new afm systems especially for uh, especially those of use for the semiconductor industry so instead of just looking at the surface uh, features uh, the the project would also be on looking at the subsurface features or the defects therein uh, so any of you who whoever is interested in applying for the phd position in uh, in such a topic can kindly contact me so uh, in my email id and uh, the phone number which i am uh, displaying it here once again so srpr@nitd.edu and uh, this is my uh, mobile number please uh, this is also the mobile number that i use for whatsapp so if you have any doubt uh, either related to uh, uh, afm characterization if you want a bit more uh, uh, you know uh, brainstorm sort of a session before you operate your afm we can have a look at uh, you know the specific settings uh, that are in your application and what sort of parameters that you would need to choose and uh, those of you who would like to uh, pursue research in this direction uh, please feel free to contact me so uh, we do have uh, uh, you know funded research projects that are awaiting your uh, contribution thank you any any other questions thank you so much sir uh, it has been a great session so far and uh, there is one question obviously you have answered other than that if there are any question uh, we are uh, open for q and a session all the participants if you have any questions or any general question regarding the phd advertisement as sir said uh, you can uh, definitely ask to the sir Uh, uh is it also possible for me to uh, you know send a brochure or something to you pooja yeah, so that yeah, you can that's, that's the other thing it. i was saying sir yeah yeah we can do it uh, i am just sharing my screen if you will permit uh, yeah, so sure. through istem also you can advertise uh, the uh, advertisement for phd scholar the best part is like with the istem you can have a database of candidates why i am saying the database sir sometime it can happen that you have only two opportunity as of now but you see right. some really good candidates who had applied for that phd now in your email uh, for how long you will find that cv so in istem within single login you can even uh, find out the database of the candidates who actually applied so it will be okay. easier for you i will just uh, just just give me a moment i would like to share the screen and all the participants please be uh, bear with us uh you can also apply through the uh, employment opportunity portal of istem and uh, slowly we are connecting with more institutions so here uh, if you will go to employment opportunity i hope my istem website is visible uh yes 
your screen is visible and yes zoom into 90 so here in the current vacancy here you can see uh, there are the vacancies that has been shared by institutions uh, or maybe some of the industries also as of now want to uh, hire with us sometime they advertise through this or they just drop a mail to us so uh, like here you can just go to after login you can just click on create vacancy you can just advertise through here i think uh, okay. Sure. There are uh, like uh, PDF and all. Also, you can add to the uh, portal. Just go to employment opportunity and like from there you can advertise. Sir. Uh, as of now, I'm not logged in. Other than that, in my vacancy, you can see the database of the candidates. So with employment opportunity, definitely uh, once you will log in, you can create a vacancy. Sure. After that, we can uh, forward it to our uh, ISTEM. Uh, like uh, there are uh, different institutions or different. uh you can say we have a database of candidates in a particular domain so we can yes definitely uh, send uh, that particular brochure to that particular students who have marked themselves as an uh, expert or as a researcher in a particular field that can okay. be done sir sure okay. apart Thank from you. that we have an ir group on istem uh, that is a whatsapp group so you can uh, also we can also advertise it across institutions via that ir are the institute representative for istem they take care of any communication that comes from istem to their institute so we okay. have different channels sir we will require one mail from your end and one advertisement on employment opportunity definitely it can be done okay sure yeah so one uh, point that i would like to drive here is that so most of the systems that you had look uh, looked at they're all being uh, you know uh, manufactured or fabricated in other countries so uh, yeah. more and more uh, uh, you know uh, in the uh, like you know in uh, indigenous, indigenous talent in, in, yeah indigenous Equipments talent that we need there, to even our talents yeah yeah we need to build more and more indigenous talent firstly in order to uh, not only to just operate this equipment but also to design and uh, you know develop the next generation microscopes or other instruments for uh, characterization so this is yeah, something uh, yeah that uh, we need to keep in mind so uh, And, these were some of the trainings in which uh, like uh, now istem is not uh, conducting these skill development training so far but they are these were some of the training by nit warangal or even kongnadu arts and science college diblugarh university uh, where the in uh, kongnadu arts and uh, science college when the uh, training was given they even opened that particular equipment uh, that ftir and they were able to understand what is the mechanism that is inside says so that tomorrow if today uh, you will explain me anything about them as a student if i am just saying just starting with the research i may not understand it directly but if i will see the them and i if i will see okay this is the way it works next step after that if uh, anything uh, like if instrumentation and anything will be talked about i will be the person who will, who will easily get it like uh, what you can say like show me how the work is done i will be more uh, connected to that process so uh, that is the thing uh, like uh, we from istem team also we were trying to connect with the labs where they can conduct such kind of training and we can help them with advertisement we can help them with the connect uh, connect with the right person for example if you are conducting in chen i am just giving an example we can only contact with the researchers who are in that particular field or the unemployed youth who has uh, like in the fine tool engineer section you can also see the details of the tool engineers who are looking for job so you can definitely uh, get some help from istem portal itself however it is a very uh, small initiative but uh, it can save a lot of time of the uh, like uh, the researchers or the associate professors or the professors who are actually or assistant professors from institutions or lab managers who are really looking into the real talent so in the fine tool engineers you can get the details of all these candidates who were trained uh, in these particular equipments at that time okay sure so th the thing is like you can also contact istem in case uh, you have a vacancy or you would like to conduct a training uh, definitely istem will try to give it full support under the scope of project okay sure yeah the uh, thanks for this uh, description pooja we'll keep Thank this in so mind much, yeah sure uh, and we will be just one email away so 
uh thank you so much sir thank you uh, for today's lecture actually it was really uh, for a student who is just starting with scanning probe microscope they can also understand what exactly uh, the equipment do so uh, that's why uh, in in this regard i think this uh, lecture is definitely going to uh, kick start the journey of a researcher in that particular field and we definitely look more complex uh, look upon more complex and uh you know uh, more advanced lectures on uh, instruments in future yeah. and uh, this uh, lecture definitely will be recorded on istem uh, india youtube channel so any of the researcher who is listening us via webex or youtube or uh, will be seeing the recorded lecture they can definitely go to the istem india youtube channel and they can uh, see the video from there also and uh, sir thank you so much for your time and uh really explaining well the topic and the potential applications and the instrumentation part of the equipment uh from my stem team we would like to really thank you for your valuable time in sharing your information yeah. uh, like valuable research uh, with the uh, researchers of the country thank you so much sir yeah thanks sir thanks a lot thanks a lot to the entire team have a good day thank you sir as of now we are closing the session and thank you all for joining